There are some states and cities and counties and jurisdictions that if you commit a crime, part of your, 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 your penalty may be that you are part of the roadside cleanup. Some of y'all have seen that. And for safety's sake, they always identify, they wear the safety vest. But there are a couple of counties that whatever your crime was, they put that crime on the vest. So if you are committed a drunk driving offense and you're assigned to clean up the highway for three days, they put a vest on you that says in big bold print, I am a drunk driver, and that's what you wear while you clean up the road. It's a sin vest. It's a shame vest. Your crime, your sin is written on it. And for a specific, and for a specified number of days to pay your debt to society, you wear that. I think there are far too many people who go to their closet and find and put on their past failures and sins, and in essence, they wear their past mistakes. They wear their past sins, and that's how they are identified. Matthew chapter 21, if you have your Bibles or if you're going to scroll in your phones, beginning with verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and with her, and with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. Now notice verse 8. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while the others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them... And those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. A very large crowd spread their coats, their vest on the road. This passage from Matthew records what we call and what we celebrate today Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This begins the Passion Week, the Holy Week, the week before, the week that leads us up to the events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And if you study the Gospels, the first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the number of chapters that are assigned to this last event will catch your imagination and your attention because they each devote a great deal of attention to the last week of Jesus' life. Now, this actual event that we're talking about today, the triumphal entry of Jesus in Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, this occurred on the 10th day of the Jewish month known as Nisan. Now, the Passover is happening at about this same time. Sunday on the triumphal entry, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday will be the Passover. Now, the process by which the Jewish families operated in Passover, and we've talked about Passover a little bit the past couple of weeks, but just as a refresher, the nation of Israel is in bondage to Egypt for 425 years. They are set free as a result of the Passover, the 10th plague, where God sends the death angel to slay the firstborn in every household. However, the Egyptians can escape this if they find themselves under the cover of an Israeli home or if they do what God told them to do was to sacrifice a lamb and put the lamb on the doorpost of their home. So when the death angel came and saw the blood of the sacrifice, the death angel would pass over that home and death did not come. So this is what they celebrate. It's like our 4th of July. Fireworks. You get the family together, you go down to H-E-B, you buy that package of eight hot dogs, and then you get the package of six hot dog buns. Why can't they not get that together? <laughs> but this is a great celebration for them. And in the process of that celebration, on the 10th, on this day that we're looking at in Scripture, on that day, that was the day the family selected the lamb 
that would be sacrificed for the Passover feast. As Jesus enters on the tent, it's like heaven says, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. This lamb has been selected to pay for the sins of all humanity. This lamb has been selected to be the sacrificial lamb. And when the sacrificial lamb has been selected and enters the scene, you can remove your sin cloak, you can remove your sin vest and the clothing of your past that bears your sin and your failure, and you can lay them before the king. You can pull out that old clothing, that old vest, that sometimes it looks good on the outside, but it's damaged on the inside, and you have hid your sins from other people. You can take those, and you can lay those before because the king is about to enter in and go through. You can take your clothing that has all the stains of sin, all the anger, all the, all the unrighteousness, all the times you got mad at your family, all the things you said, something you wish you hadn't said, all of those things that, that bother you that Satan brings back up to you. Remember, all the stains on your life, you can take those, and lay those before the king because he's coming. You can take all the black things, the dark things, the things that you hope nobody ever knows, the things you want to take to your grave, the things you saw on a computer you know you shouldn't have seen, the lies you told, the things you didn't tell the person at HR Block. <laughs> I'm getting into your business this morning, aren't I? All of the things that we think label us, those sin vests that carry and talk about the things, we lay those before the kings on this day because the lamb has been selected to pay the penalty for that sin. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to take the same approach as the court system. And we wear that vest and we try to figure out the debt that we have to pay while we wear that. And the problem with our approach is we never know how much work to do. Drunk driving is that three days cussing at somebody on Dowling Road when they pull out in front of us. I think there's an exemption for that, in all honesty. <laughs> Is that two days? See, if God had a work system, God would have told us the number of days and what to do with this system, but he didn't do that. But on Palm Sunday, the lamb has been selected, and now God deals with us through our sin based on what Jesus did and not what you do. So it's not a work that we have to do where we bear our sin, where we wear it on the outside. We understand that God now sees not our sin, but he sees his son. Now, what happens when you take that sin vest off and you lay it before Jesus? Staying within the context of this passage in Matthew chapter 21, what happens? There's a couple things I want us to look at very quickly this morning. One, we discover that Jesus is more appealing than religion. Now, some of you would say, what Jesus, Christian, and religion, I thought those were all synonymous. We kind of make a little nuance in the difference in the terms there. When you look at this passage, when you look at the history in the New Testament, Jesus was more appealing then, and I submit he still is now. When we can get religion and man-made tradition out of the way and just present who Jesus is, what he does, and the fact that we can take our sin and lay it before him and he walks over that, Jesus becomes so much more appealing than anything that a church could ever do for you. A very large crowd joined in in the welcoming of Jesus because he was a breath of fresh air in a stagnant religious environment. This was the, the, the Old Testament law versus this new spirit that was coming in through Jesus. And all the Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious leaders who had these laws, you had to follow and you had to do this. It was the old versus the new. And how many of you can, can just testify this morning? Sometimes the new is a lot better. How many of you, let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room have never made a phone call on a rotary dial phone, would you lift your hand? How many of you have never used a phone like that before in your life? Come on. Come on. Yeah. You don't know what you have missed out on. You put your finger in one of those little holes, and you spun it around, and if you messed up the spinning around, you had to hang up, disconnect the little thing on the button, and start over again. Now, that's not the best part of it. When I would go to Grandma Thornhills in Pineville, Louisiana, she just didn't have a rotary phone. She had what was called a party line. Come on, can I get a witness in the house this morning? The phone would ring at Granny's, and I go, I'm going I'm to get this. No, 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 don't get it. That's not my ring. I mean, that's not your ring. My ring is two rings. The neighbor's house is one ring. The neighbor on the other side is three rings. The one across the street is two quick rings. So everybody was on this same line, and you knew it was your call based on what ring it was. And if you were real good, you could pick the phone up and listen to everybody else's phone calls. <laughs> Come on. That's, that's great. But now, that's the old. But what do we have now? Oh, man, we have this. 
Everywhere you go, you can take it with you. You can take a book with you and read with it. You can take your music with you. You can watch TV and a movie. You can do your crossword puzzles on this phone. This is amazing. This can give you directions on where you are going. This phone has GPS on it. Sue and I, I told you we went to the Astros game a week or two ago, and we were looking for a restaurant, so we put the restaurant into the GPS, and it was amazing because the GPS will now tell me, turn right at the jack-in-the-box. <laughs> no longer does it say in 400 feet you will turn east. It now knows there's a jack-in-the-box on the corner and turn right where the jack-in-the-box is. How many of you appreciate the new, Amy? Come on, yes, indeed. In Matthew chapter 15, a group of Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, there are some people who are transgressing our traditions. And Jesus said, you have made the word of God no effect because of your traditions. It is your traditions that are transgressing God's law and God's commandment. And as you read through the Gospels, one of the things that I have come to notice is that prostitutes, criminals, and tax collectors were very easy to hang out with Jesus. What a trouble. It was the Pharisees, it was the religious people. As a matter of fact, the most scathing statements that Jesus ever made, he made to religious people. Now, what is the difference between Jesus and religion? One, religion emphasizes the outward. Jesus emphasizes the inside. The Bible tells us that God, that man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. The Bible tells us out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is on the inside is far more important than what is on the outside. But we judge the outside. We classify by the outside. How are they dressed? How they act? What do they do? We put all this emphasis on the outside, and a religious person will say, if they're not dressed right, they're not acting right, on all these outside things, they're probably not welcome in our church. But if you are a Jesus person as opposed to a religious person, you're going to look at the inside, and the inside is going to be more important. Secondly, Religion is about what you can't do. Jesus is about what you can do. Now, we do need some boundaries. There are some right things that we do, and there are some wrong things that we don't do. God gave us ten commandments, and sometimes you need to look at those and consider them as the tender commandments. God gives us direction in that fashion so that we will not get over into an area of life that would destroy our life. He gives us those boundaries and barriers so that we will live a good life. But religion, or don't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. But Jesus says you can serve here, you can love here, you can do those things. When you look at that from that perspective, that tells you the difference. Thirdly, religion puts up barriers. Jesus pulls down barriers. My goal, now here's, let's, let me back up. The Bible tells us the gospel is offensive. There is no way in the world somebody can come into a church where the word of God is preached and on occasion not be offended or have your toes stepped on or have the Holy Spirit do a little something in you that makes you a little uncomfortable. That's the purpose of the Word of God. However, the goal of Christian fellowship should be this, that when an unchurched person walks in, when somebody who doesn't believe in God, doesn't know Jesus, when they walk in, they should say something to this effect when they walk out. I didn't agree with everything he said, but doggone, they sure treated me good while I was there. The only offensive thing that should be in a Jesus church is the gospel. And any time we put a barrier up that prevents somebody from finding Christ or entering in, we have just become pharisaical and religious and not Jesus. Fourthly, religion works your way to God. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus is more appealing than religion. And when you take your sin vest off and throw it before the king, you will also discover that Scripture is more reliable than opinion. That's the second thing. Back to Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, verse 1, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now verse 4. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. What was happening on that day, that Sunday when Jesus entered the triumphal entry, it was prophesied in Scripture thousands of years ago. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As you become more acquainted with this book, 
especially learning about Jesus, your life changes. Now, everybody's got an opinion of Jesus, but God's revelation is more important than any person's estimation. People may see you only as a part of what your vest said on it. They may only interpret or, per, or have a perception of you based on what your sin vest was. But what this book tells you about yourself and what God tells you about you is that he no longer sees that sin. He sees his son. And when you begin to have, under that, have that understanding, when you discover that about Jesus, you discover about yourself as well. And you begin to see yourself with the same perspective that Christ saw. So scripture is more important than any man's opinion opinion about you, and Scripture is more important, most importantly, about Jesus than what people might think about God. Because peace and security will come into your mind when your life is governed by God's Word and not people's opinions. I know it is a stretch for our society today, but I can tell you beyond any shadow of doubt in my mind, I thoroughly believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He existed in heaven before eternity. And the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. And God was not called off guard on Good Friday. It was a plan that he sent his son into this world. And I am totally convinced I don't know how God did this. I don't know how God does a lot of things. If I could figure God out, he would not be much of a God. And even though your IQ may be a few points higher than mine, if you could figure him out, he's still not that, not that much uh, he wouldn't be that much of a God. So the fact that he is above and beyond some of our reasoning does not concern me. It causes me to worship and exalt him. So when the Bible tells me he came into this world born of a virgin that the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, I have no option but to believe God somehow did that and a sinless, perfect man was brought into this world and he lived a sinless, perfect life and 33 years into his life they crucified him on a Roman cross. They put nails in his hands. They whipped him on his back. They put a crown of thorns on his head and he died on that cross and they took him down, wrapped him up, placed him in a borrowed tomb and three days later, I don't know how again but God spoke life back into him. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of God where he intercedes for me today. Scripture is more reliable. He, yes, he was a great teacher. Yes, he was a prophet. Yes, he was a moral leader. But he was the son of God come into this world. And just as it says in Acts chapter 1, this same Jesus who you see ascending in the crowds will come back. Yes. Scripture is more important than opinion. Finally this morning, following is more important than inspection. Let me try to explain that statement. Luke 19, it'll be on the screen. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. This is the same event from a different gospel. Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. The people are rejoicing, but he's crying. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring peace, now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when, you, when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming. Jesus has just told the people in Jerusalem that a tragedy is coming that could be avoided if they would have just simply followed him. There are four groups of people that are in this story here in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke 19. There are disciples who have walked with him for three years. They know him well. They have, been, they have seen him in front of people and in, 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 in privacy. Secondly, there are the eyewitnesses, the Bible tells us, who were there who saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Third, there are the hearsay witnesses. They weren't there, but they've heard the testimony from it. And fourthly, there are the Pharisees that are there. All four in the same location seeing the exact same thing, but it's interpreted differently. Because some of those who are rejoicing today that he's coming will be the same ones that will be shouting, crucify him in about four or five days. God does not expect you to check your brains at the door. By all means... Study, analyze, observe, look at it. I was born and raised in church all of my life, and I am not here today because mom brought me to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and every revival, and every women's conference, and every prayer meeting. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'm here today because I looked at what the evidence was. 
and I made a conscious, logical decision that you could not explain this world a fact from, uh, aside from the fact that somebody was in charge and put it in place. As a result of that, my observation, my inspection, I resulted with that by following Jesus. Now, the question for us this morning is, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you, how will you respond on your day of visitation? Is your day of visitation right now? Is God visiting you? Is there a tug on the inside of your heart and your stomach? If God is saying, I'm pulling, I, I want you to understand. I want you to follow me today. You've heard everything. You've seen everything. You've been here for weeks and weeks, weeks, months and months. It, today is the day of visitation. Because what happens one week from now as we start the Holy Week? What happens on Friday is that all the vest, all the coats, all the sin vest, all the shame vest are laid before Jesus. And Jesus picks them up and he bears them. He wears our shame vest for us. The Bible says that God laid on him the iniquity of us all. But the gospel doesn't stop there. See, there's another component to it. Not only does Jesus bear these, but God has something else hanging in the closet. He gives us a coat of righteousness that we get to put on. We didn't do anything to deserve it. There's no work we could do to honor that. But God clothes us with righteousness. So that when he sees us, he doesn't see the stains. He doesn't see the black things. He doesn't see the, the things that are hidden. He doesn't see the damaging things. He, and, and he doesn't see a blue blazer either. Don't, don't get past that. He sees what God has placed on us, his love, his grace, his mercy. And that is what the gospel is about. Galatians chapter 3. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. All, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You don't know how I failed. You don't know how I've messed up. You it, it doesn't matter. Those things have been taken off and placed, and the king has ridden over them. And he's given you a new set of clothes. You have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the amazing thing about this gospel. Everybody in this room, it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is, doesn't matter what your past is, doesn't matter what your history is, nobody in here is better than you. And nobody in here is worse than you. For the individuals in here who have worn those vests and cleaned up the side of the road, this is still your home. This is still your family. All of that is erased and wiped away. For if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You don't have to wear that shame vest anymore. Today is the day we lay our cloaks and our coats and those vests before the Lord. Today is the day that we can shout, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is just, it, it, it's, it's almost an undefinable word. But it conveys the message that he will deliver, he will save. If you are here this morning, and you really can't even explain how you got here, but the only thing that runs through your mind is your past, and you feel like when you walked into this place, that past was written on a piece of clothing, and everybody identified you by that. What we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, the entrance into Jerusalem, can symbolize Jesus' entrance into your life. And he can clothe you completely and totally different today.